Hey guys, so some of you are wondering why I do things certain ways uh, when I'm doing my videos. It's a question that pops up quite a bit. Someone will say, you know, why would you go through subdivision modeling on a shape like this? And you could just add a bevel, right? Something like that will pop up every now and then. And this is true. You can do this. You can add a bevel. There's no problem with that. Uh, but subdivision has some benefits, and it depends on what you need the model for, on whether you're going to use subdivision or not. So. If you're doing any kind of deformations, like a simple deform here, I'll just do a twist. This is going to work out way better on a sub-D model than it ever would on a, a Boolean Ingon model, especially if you had other details already kind of taking place, like a bevel here, like that. This kind of defines your resolution in this area. So you could, of course, you know, manually rework it. If you're doing bakes from high polys to low polys, you could use remeshers and things like that. Um, but if you're doing like a mid-poly workflow for a game model, it's kind of what you see is what you get. You can't really do uh, a whole lot more to it, perhaps. Not, like, at least not this extreme. You can do some things like dicing and twist it a little bit. Uh, but your shading will eventually start to break down. And you just simply can't do this. Now, this isn't going to be for everybody, obviously. You're not going to probably twist things a whole lot. But you can do things like um, shape keys, right? So shape keys are great. Because if you were to ever need to say like a vehicle runs into a shape like this and we can set up sculpting here so i'm going to try using grab first uh, yeah so we can kind of like run into things create damage uh, do numbers like that so you can see here if we wanted to do like a slow animation like a slow motion animation of a vehicle running into it and the bumper falling apart or whatever um, we can use shape keys to deform this mesh so it looks like it's been impacted, which is quite nice. Of course, this isn't a super realistic setup here, but you get the idea. You just simply can't do that with um, standard modeling Boolean and gun sometimes. Uh, but quads and subdivisions certainly will allow you to uh, fully exploit your meshes in ways such as that, including other sculpting techniques that might be useful if you wanted to maybe create the idea that it starts melting or something. I think you get the idea here. Actually, let's start a new one. Do a new shape key for that one. So yeah, maybe we want to make it start melting. And we can do things like this as well. So this is more of an animation thing. So when it comes to static mesh, you're probably not going to need to do this on most of it. There's certain times you might use shape keys on some meshes that are um, animated that otherwise would be static mesh, but generally you're not going to need it, right? So if we do that as a very slow animation, uh, it could give the illusion that it is uh, starting to melt, perhaps, right? So those are little things you can do, and that's kind of the difference between Boolean Ingon, standard modeling versus subdivision. Uh, subdivision is fairly flexible, and not to mention the fact that the subdivision itself, if it ever starts to look too distorted, uh, you can always increase the resolution of the subdivision. Not only can you do that, these are keyframe capable. So if you start here at zero, you can press I, keyframe it, go to another level, bump it up, keyframe it, go to another level, keyframe it. So if you were to do like a pan in or a zoom in, uh, you would actually be able to increase the resolution um, as your animations are taking place, right? So little things like that uh, you could find quite useful, perhaps. If we turn off optimal display, you'll see how that actually works a little bit better. You can see without that on, you don't really see a big difference in the, uh, the mesh itself. And so that might be a thing. Now, um, it comes down to something else as well. Like once again, if you need to deform the mesh, it's one thing, but also if it's gonna occupy a lot of screen space, you may want to uh, have it be capable of being subdivided because you can see if we were using finite meshes, we would potentially have uh, you know, something like this, and that doesn't look very good. And if we have Ant-Man standing on a generator or something, I don't know, it wouldn't look that great. So you can bump up the resolutions here, perhaps, until it, you know, it looks appropriate for the screen space that it's occupying. So it's good for rendering in general. It's good for baking normal maps. It's good for deformation. Uh, it is more lengthy. It takes up more time. So if you're doing a lot of props for a video game and you're doing mid-poly workflow, there's a good odd chance even the um, high polys you make with 
standard modeling and doing bevels and whatnot, they tend to bake down to low poly models fairly well. Okay, they're not going to give you as good of a result, perhaps, as if you made it in subdivision. Uh, subdivision always just generates really good normal maps, in my opinion, but uh, it certainly will save you a ton of time, too. And you can't argue with that when, especially you're working on like indie projects, you got to do a lot of stuff. And so if you have to um, fly through it, just modeling, you're not going to probably end up going with subdivision unless you had to, um, unless you're doing like maybe characters, because obviously they need to deform or certain types of um, static props, perhaps. So generally speaking, hard surface stuff, it's a good odd chance you're not going to be doing a whole lot of melting of stuff. And even Boolean InGon, you can fracture things still. So it's it's not necessary to, to use subdivision to create damaged models and things of that nature. But it can be helpful if you're creating super high detailed objects. So if you were to take a look at some actual real world examples, I go to my images folder here. I got some aircraft in here. Um, if you ever notice surface details anyways, they're very minor. You can see here in the reflection, the surface of this aircraft, the, uh, the paint and the panels are just all over the place. It's, it's not a smooth surface really at all. I mean, it looks kind of smooth from a distance, but it's, it's really not. And this will happen even on more modern, newer military aircraft, but it's much more subtle. Of course, these were better manufactured because of the newer um, manufacturing processes. But even then, you can see there's just little slight deviations in the edges and whatnot. And trying to do all that with Boolean InGon, you're going to still have to up-res your mesh quite a bit to capture that for a high poly bake anyways. And so you do need to pay attention to little things like that because they could be uh, maybe not super important, but you'll end up with a, um, especially if you're doing like renders and game models, not as much, but when you want to really capture the realism of something, there's just slight deviations everywhere. Um, and you can really sell that effect by just paying attention to things like this, like this line going down here. It looks like it was just masked there almost. And it's got a slight little curve to it, right? I mean, it could be a pers uh, perspective issue. Like it could just be because it's rounded, but more than likely it feels like somebody used masking tape and they just painted the, the tip there a little bit different. Um, and also because aircraft, you got to think about the way things are manufactured. Aircraft, when they paint them, they use like a filler on them usually that fills in all the little cracks and crevices and uh, things like that. The paint's pretty thick from my understanding. Uh, so this right here looks like this panel was opened up at some point. And uh, because of that, it looks like they had to use maybe a, um, something to pry it open. It could have been just a screwdriver or like a crowbar or something, probably to rip that paint apart so that they can get into that place. And they probably had to um, kind of go back over and retouch it perhaps at some point or something like that. I'm not real sure. I'm not an A6 uh, mechanic, obviously, but um, from my understanding, that is something that occurs. And so uh, some, some manufactured pieces, like brand new, uh, machine pieces, casted pieces, usually have little to no imperfections on them, generally speaking. Uh, plastic tends to be, you know, pretty solid overall as far as like shapes and forms go, um, unless it's been left out in uh, the rain or the sun or it gets weathered. Plastic tends to kind of lose its uh, shape a little bit when it heats up and cools back down, heats up and cools back down, or if you're using it a lot. So think of like uh, plastic pots in the garden. If you ever look at them, they have like little dents in them and all kinds of other fun stuff going on. So your surface details are actually quite important. And so that's something you can consider when you're working mesh like this as well. I'm not saying that you have to subdivide it to achieve those results, but you're going to need mesh to do it basically. And so you might want to just create a couple little deviations, just tiny little ones. It doesn't even have to be much. Something as simple as that will start to increase the believability of whatever it is you're working on. And so that will apply to subdivision or Boolean in gun. And at a certain point, you're still going to end up with fairly high poly models. These aren't game optimized meshes. So if you're ever wondering when you're looking at my videos, why sometimes I completely ignore the idea of um, the face count and whatnot when I do things like this, it's, it's okay when baking and you're not going to really render a whole scene perhaps. Um, and you're going to bake down to a lower poly model anyways. It's okay if you need to deform things and animate them. Uh, but generally speaking, it's not like a super um, super optimized sub D model, obviously, right? And so, you know, 
You can of course uh, optimize things if you have good edge flows rather easy. So that's not a big deal either. It's like, for example, we don't need these ones in here perhaps later on. We just want to reduce a little overhead. You can just start dissolving whatever you don't really need, right? So that's something you can do. Oh, one last thing here. The, um, the um, shape keys, right? You can also do things like extrusions and scales, and it will hold those. You see how it goes back into place? It's kind of cool that it does that, if you never thought about that before. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so my videos, a lot of times when I'm showing you how to subdivide a simple shape, like in this case, it was originally just a topo practice to kind of play around with the eat pole underneath here and kind of figure out how you can make this thing behave differently. It's just about opening up the idea of finding different solutions to problems you might be presented with topology. Um, so if you're doing like a subdivision of a flat triangular surface, uh, it might not seem like it needs subdivision necessarily because what ends up happening is like, you could do it with Boolean ingon way faster possibly. But if that triangular surface is, or like a flat surface anyways, is part of a mesh where there's curves on other parts of it and you still need to subdivide it all, or it needs to go extra large in size, or uh, maybe it needs to deform even, you know, there's still going to be reasons why you want to subdivide, possibly subdivide um, hard surface shapes that are relatively simple and flat and whatnot. Now that's going to be on you. It's a judgment call. Each 3D project, you know, you need to think about what your end goal is with it, right? If you're doing like super high fidelity renders, you might want to go with subdivision. If you're just doing kind of um, VFX shots with a bunch of chaos going on, that's kind of doesn't occupy a whole lot of screen space. You might just use the simplest model possible. It might be fine for that. Um, game objects, once again, you're doing lots and lots of props. Probably don't want to subdivide every one of them if, if not, or if possible. So I kind of live by two, two sayings here. If I need subdivision for any reason, I'm going to use it because I just need it. Um, if I don't need it, I'm not going to use it. And if it's a super simple model and it's easy enough to just do subdivision real quick, I'll probably use it anyways. And so when you're working on projects, like a, a more complicated object with a bunch of little parts and pieces and stuff, you can actually mix Boolean and God with subdivision and use them both kind of at the same time if you wanted to. And you can work a Boolean ingon model to a subdivision model later, or you could take a subdivision model and cut up with Booleans and create ingons and create a mesh out of that as well. So it, it's not really like a set in stone thing necessarily. Uh, what is right is going to be dependent on your project though. Okay. So that's why I just wanted to talk about this real quick because I get this uh, kind of comment pop up quite a bit or these questions pop up quite a bit. Uh, and then of course there's other techniques too. So whenever I'm showing you something possibly in a video, there's probably like uh, nine different ways to do the same thing, right? So if you're working on a cylinder, and like you need to wrap it up, you want to work on a plane first and then wrap it up into the cylinder shape with a simple deform modifier doing like a bin, that's possible. And it's actually a really good working technique, uh, which I'll make another video about. But you're not always going to have that luxury to do that. You might have a cylindrical shape already with some detail on it, and then you might need to change something later, right? So how do you change that detail without going back to a plane and starting all over um, while still maintaining the cylindrical shapes? There's ways to do that too. And so, you know, just having a better understanding of the tools, how to work with them, the different techniques, it goes really far. And uh, you should definitely learn uh, the multiple ways of you might, the ways to uh, handle these things. You might need them, right? But the more you understand topology and subdivision modeling in general, the easier of a time you're going to have also with Boolean ingon possibly, right? Because it's still at the end of the day, it's topology. And um, when you're doing a big ingon and you don't know how that ingon's uh, behaving, perhaps, why you're getting shading issues or errors, why the mesh triangulates the way it does, you, you know, it all relates back to that topology at the end of the day. So with that in mind, I hope this video kind of clarifies some things. That's the whole idea of it. Um, you know, Take your time with your, your modeling and just kind of figure out what kind of ways you like to work. There's nothing wrong with just, um, you know, kind of sticking with like tried and true methods like standard modeling, subdivision, uh, using booleans along the way. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but you can also, you know, just play with full Boolean workflow if you wanted to as well. There's really 
there's no limits. It's just modeling tools. I'm going to keep, keep saying this one. It's just modeling at the end of the day, right? And um, you just need to be able to manage what you're creating, right? That's what the whole idea of being a 3D artist is. You not only know how to use your tools, but artistically um, create them in, in great looking ways, aesthetic ways, right? Capable ways for maybe animation and whatnot as well. So um, yeah, that's it for this one, guys. I hope that kind of clarifies some things and I'll check you out in the next video. Take care.